How are you all tonight? Great. I'm Marla. Oh, that's the bad spot. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Marla Ottenstein. I am a professional organizer, and I also write two columns for the Naples Daily News. Who reads my columns? Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Get organized and get organized in a flash. And remember, it's not just about closets and garages. It's about getting organized and ready for a hurricane. It's about doing your paperwork. It's about knowing what's going on, preparing for the next step. Trust me, we're all going there someday, okay? So um, I am passionate about helping people be prepared for a hurricane. Last year, Dan and I gave uh, two seminars. This year we did it again. And I am truly passionate about making sure people are prepared. So tonight you're going to hear me speak, Marla Ottenstein. You're also going to hear Dan Summers. We like to call it the dog and pony show. <laughs> Dan is the um, manager for the Collier County Emergency Services. And wait until you hear him speak. You're going to just be overwhelmed. I'm going to ask again for phones off, please, because this is being streamed live. Makes me a little nervous, you know? Um, anyway, though, we're gonna have fun tonight and let the, uh, let the games begin. I'm gonna speak for 20 minutes. I know I said it before. Dan's gonna speak for 20 minutes. And then we're gonna have a Q&A. And if we go a little bit over the hour, I'm sure it's okay with you, all right? All right, and what we do is during the Q&A, we just ask that um, you really listen to the answers because sometimes when you're thinking about the question, it's being answered, right? That's what teachers used to always tell me although my hand was up. So, everybody has a hurricane checklist. Let me, I'm gonna pull one out of here, okay? Thank you. We all have a hurricane checklist, and you're looking at it, and you're saying, come on in. And you're saying to yourselves, oh my goodness, there is so much to do. It's sort of like when you go into your office and you see piles and piles, and you say, oh my goodness, I can't get through the piles, right? Well, the secret, oh, that thing, the secret to getting organized and prepared is not to think about it all at once, okay? But I want you to think about it in steps, all right? It's easier if you get prepared in steps. Now, you know what? There are some empty spaces. There's one up here. There's one up here and a couple over there. This is a great turnout. I really appreciate everybody coming. Really, really, really appreciate it. So. <laughs> When you look at this list, I don't want you to think in terms of, oh my goodness, this woman is crazy. This list is just really long. Because it's broken up. Things that are standard essentials. Things that throughout the year you can replenish. Um, certain things that you should do in advance of hurricane season. Such as, you know, making sure, here you go, oh you got one. Making sure that your insurance is up to date. And you're probably looking at the list and saying, Oh, I don't have room in my house for all of this stuff. Well, everything that you see here today, with the exception of the gas tank, literally fits in these two bins. Okay? Now, I do have other things at home. I've got more gas tanks. I've got little things of propane. But essentially, it doesn't take up that much room. And I'm sure that you've got a lot of stuff in your garage anyway. So what's two more bins, right? <laughs> That was a, I had to get that little organizing dig in there. So um, I'm going to go through the list, not everything. And you know, you're saying to yourself, well, of course I have batteries. But first, I'm going to tell you a story. Who here remembers Hurricane Wilma? Yeah, me too. So I'm driving down. I'm driving down 95 with my mom from up north. And we're headed to Naples. And the next thing you know, because the hurricane's go to the to come into Naples and I want to protect my house and then all of a sudden it's not coming to Naples it's going to the East Coast and then it's going back to Naples mother nature is temperamental okay we ended up going to the East Coast my dog my mother me and an ex-boyfriend <laughs> really truly an ex-boyfriend anyway though um so I said to my mom how are you set for hurricane supplies and she says oh I've got plenty Really, let me see. Let me, do you have your little bin? She goes, Marla, you worry too much. I've got water. And she holds up a six-pack of Perrier. <laughs> Not the big bottles. These are like the little bottles, right? I said, okay, where are the flashlights? Oh, 
holds up her keychain. She's got a little flashlight this big. I said, okay, and what about the other supplies? You worry too much. There I was at Walmart in Boca Raton, need I say more, the night before Hurricane Wilma hit. It was not fun. To this day, we don't talk about it, although my mom will say, wasn't that fun? Like, where was I? No, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. But the point is, you have to be prepared, and you cannot wait for the minute that a hurricane is going to hit. Okay? So, so many things on this list are things that you probably already have in your house. But you're thinking to yourself, oh, I have them. I can gather them up, right? My suggestion is to buy these things in advance. Okay? So, for example, um, little... I've got to watch out for that mic. You know, these little uh, flame things, these little match things. I'm sure you've got them all over the house because you need them for your barbecue, you need them for your candles. Go out to the dollar store, buy three or four more. Put them in the bin. Okay, put them in the bin. Screwdrivers. We all have a tool chest, but I'm going to suggest that you take the screwdrivers that are in, go and buy new ones. Don't buy cheap ones, buy good ones. What do you need a screwdriver for, right? Everything. Everything, thank you, I love you. What do you need duct tape for? I don't know, but I have it. Um, but you know, you need a screwdriver. If I couldn't get my screens out of my windows the last hurricane, I had to get the screens out so I could close my hurricane shutters. Thank goodness I had a really good um, screwdriver. I'm just showing you a couple of things. Landline phone. Who here still has a landline? Oh, I love this. This is a good demographic. You know, there are times that you need a landline. Let me tell And it's not just a landline. But it's a landline phone, but it's an old-fashioned phone. This was $5.95 at Walmart. Why do you need this? Because when most of the telephone poles go down or the cellular goes down, this will work. This, you don't, you don't want to buy one that has a little electric outlet. You want to buy an old-fashioned phone, okay? Now, you're saying to yourself, I don't have time to go shopping for this stuff. Am I right? People are saying that. Well, have you ever heard of the Internet? <laughs> Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace Hardware, keep it local if you can, right? Um, Amazon Prime. I... I love Amazon Prime. Where else do you think somebody could find a pair of bright yellow boots? I have these because I'm fearful of snakes, okay? So I have these if I have to go outside because snakes come out after a storm. Amazon Prime. I think they were $14.95, but that's because they were so ugly. Um, <laughs> then this is my favorite thing. It's called the Atomic Beam. Now, I found this because a client showed me this. I had a really big lantern, and a client said, oh, look at this. It's this big. Okay? Batteries in the bottom. And what's really great, whoops, let me show you. You open it. You can hang it. You can hang it. It will light up a bedroom. Now, on a lot of things, you never know, you never want to run out of batteries, right? We had the wrong batteries. So what I did on my flashlights, because I'm so organized, I wrote D batteries. Now I have a whole separate container of batteries. And I don't keep batteries in anything when I'm not using them because they get corroded, okay? Buy a good flashlight. Try to limit the number of batteries that you use. I'm only, everything I buy is AA or D because then it just gets too darn confusing when you have the C's and the triple A's and everything else. Um, hefty. I don't like Ziploc, I like Hefty. I'm brand loyal. You, you never have enough Ziploc bags, right? You never have enough of these bags. What do you use them for? You can put ice in this ahead of time. You can put uh, dirty tissues, because you know, after a hurricane, you're sure to have some things that are dirty and you want to put them in a um, a Ziploc bag of sorts, okay? Uh, number one question people ask me, why don't you just use uh, tinfoil 
Why do I suggest pre-cut pieces of tin foil? Because it's easy. That's my answer. It's easy. And they're a dollar at the dollar store. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm just showing you a couple things, okay? When you look at the list, you're going to understand. I'm a coffee person. You know, you can buy Starbucks coffee in cans, or you can buy, um, go to Trader Joe's. They've got cold brew coffee. I like to brew my coffee, and it stays hot for 24 hours, sometimes 48. But I'm prepared. So, you know, you have to think about the things that are going to get you through the first 72 hours, right, Dan? 72 hours after a hurricane. Now, after six days of not washing my hair, <clears throat> right? So they're little things. After six days of not washing my hair, dry shampoo. It works wonders. Make sure you find one that's unscented, though, because there are mosquitoes. It really makes a difference. Don't wait till your hair is dirty. Do it every day. Another thing that's great are these little wipies. You know, like these baby wipes. They're great. So, you know, I didn't have electricity for five days, but when the electricity came back on, I still couldn't get home to my house because there were so many trees down. So I stayed someplace, and yes, I dunk in the pool every day. I was lucky I had a pool. Um, but, you know, there are other, you know, personal care things. But you've got to look at the big picture, right? So you like to take a shower or bath every day. Sometimes you might just have to use a baby wipe. Or sometimes you might have to use these little, you know, disposable toothbrushes. With every hurricane, you learn more and more. So I'm going to show you a couple other things, talk about the list a little bit more. The O2, I know I'm not supposed to endorse things, but I'm sorry. I'm going to endorse, endorse, endorse. This is the greatest thing in the whole wide world. Vicki, where are you? Was this your lifesaver this week? My air conditioner went out two weeks ago. She loaned me two of those, and I was able to use them. Okay, so they're fabulous. These are $30 or maybe $40 um, at Home Depot. This information is on that list. Don't worry. And not this one, but you have their battery operated or plug-in, and you also have um, a USB charger. And it's another reason why you need a screwdriver, Phillips, because you've got to get the screws in there, okay? Um, most of this stuff I got on Amazon, or at Ace, or at Home Depot. Water, every time I go to Trader Joe's, I get a 48 pack of water. And I check my supplies throughout the year. Because sometimes, you know, you run out of batteries, right? And you go into your battery supply and you use just a couple. But hurricane season comes and all of a sudden, just a couple, they've added up, right? So you need to check these things frequently. So these are the physical things. These are the things that you can buy. But what other things can you do? I'm going to look. So as far in advance as possible. This is broken down. It actually has little blocks for you to put a check mark in. So after you've gotten your um, silicone pot cover for your tub drain, or after you've started to save milk containers, you know, to fill with water so you can flush the toilet, um, a bug repellent, flashlights, um, large coolers. As you get all of these things, put little check marks next to it, okay? It's really easy. And I am going to suggest no candles. Open flames. So I used to go and buy candles. Scented, of course. But that's because I thought that, you know, that was a good idea. It's not. My friend Dan said, and he taught me, nine people died. Nine? As a, during seven Hugo. Or, during Hurricane Hugo. And their deaths were directly related to fires caused by open flames. That's why those little LED lanterns are so fantastic. They're really, really great. Um, let me just see here. Um, drinking water, you know, you need that. Um, trim your trees. Trim your trees. Don't wait until the day before. Trim your trees because, you know, one coconut, that's a missile. That could just break your windows, right? Um, if you travel and you're out of town for a week, 10 days, two weeks, 
Make plans, not with your neighbors. Your neighbors have enough on their minds, okay? Have a home watch service that you can depend on, that is professional, that they, the home watch service will put your um, shutters in. It's worth the money. Whatever they charge, pay it, okay? My home watch guy, I only need him for a week in the summer. I pay him for the whole month because I know when I'm gone, with my luck, there's going to be a hurricane. But I also know that he's going to have those shutters up. Um, so this also breaks down one week before the storm. So a lot of people wait, right? And you sit there and you wait. And you, you're watching the little map. And you're thinking, it's not coming this way, right? And then all of a sudden it turns. Was it Charlie? Charlie was headed right here. And then at the last minute it went up to Benita. Like the last 10 minutes. And I'm sitting in my apartment thinking it's going to hit me. It didn't, but we were lucky. But you know, you can't wait for three days before. You have to be prepared, which brings me to another topic. I'm not taking this away from Dan, but have a plan in advance. So if you have a family and you know that you don't want to be here for the hurricane, make plans. Don't wait until six o'clock the night before a hurricane and stick to your plan. So if you have a plan that you're going to load up the car and you have an emergency bag for everybody, a little suitcase, everybody has a suitcase, and you're going to get out of Dodge, get in the car and go. Otherwise, you know, everybody's stuck in traffic, right? Why were they stuck in traffic? Because they waited until three o'clock the day before the hurricane was going to hit. Of course they had to wait 17 hours on I-75. And of course they had problem getting gas. So make a plan and stick to it. Um, food, you all know that. Some of these things are just common sense. So I always say, wash your dirty laundry. People say, why? Well, you know what? You might not have a washer and dryer be working for a week and you want to have your laundry and your towels clean. Um, this also breaks it down. 24 hours before a storm. There's a lot in here about your um, appliances, your air conditioning unit, your refrigerator, um, different appliances, what should be turned off, what should be cranked up to make it really cold. I'm not going to go into those details because it's written here. It's really, really easy. And if you're not sure about something, feel free. My website is, and my website's on the bottom and you can contact me. So if you have a question, like why should you make ice in advance? Or why should you crank your AC, you know, down to like 63 degrees? Those kind of questions, feel free to email me, okay? As I said, this is a subject I'm passionate about. If you email me, I will get back to you within 48 hours. I promise, okay? Um, talks about the day of the storm. During the storm, um, once again, have a plan. And if you want, you can go to, you can go to um, NaplesNews.com and put in my name and you can see the um, hurricane story that part one and part two. And it talks in detail more about the things that I'm, that are five, five words here. It gives you more details. Um, it talks about after the storm and pet owners. You need to do things like have, make sure no matter how well behaved your pet is. You know, you read in the newspaper and you see on the news all these abandoned animals, all these animals that are floating down the river and they're on a piece of wood, right? And people have lost their animals. That's because they think, oh, my animal has never run away from me before. Well, how many times has your dog or cat gone through a hurricane, right? So get your animals, if you love your animals, like I love my dog sometimes, um, get a chip. <laughs> if you met my dog, you know what I'm talking about. Get a chip, put them on a harness, not just a leash, but a harness. Remember, you're nervous, right? They're nervous too. They're as nervous as you are. So you need to be prepared. Now, I know you've had enough fun and games with me. I'm really keeping it to 20 minutes. In fact, I kept it to 18. But um, afterwards, we're going to have a Q&A. And as I said, really, feel free to email me if you have a specific question, OK? And we all learn. Every time there's a hurricane or a tropical storm, we learn new things, OK? 
So a lot of these, I never had a stove until this year. I do have um, propane at home. But you know, there's certain things I never had, but every year I learn about what I need. If you know a hurricane's coming, cook your food. Cook all your meats, okay? If you know you're going out of town, and I know people say, oh, I know this, but you know, hurricane's coming, your refrigerators are not emptied, and what happens? I cleaned out several homes after the hurricane, and it was not pretty. I have a girlfriend who had thousands of dollars worth of food, just went bad, and guess what? She went back up north, and she restocked her freezer and refrigerator with all this meat, and she says, oh, it couldn't happen again. So, you know, be prepared, be smart, and don't think that your neighbor is going to clean out your refrigerator. I'm going to charge double this time if I had to clean out someone's refrigerator. It is the most disgusting thing I've ever done in my entire life. I had to wear a mask, but really, and double gloves, double latex gloves. Um, but <laughs> you all think I'm joking? I'm a germ freak, and cleaning out a refrigerator is disgusting. Anyway, though, be prepared, be smart, and don't depend on somebody else to do this for you. You're out there. You're, you're on your own, okay? And as Dan's going to talk more about, be prepared for 72 hours that you're going to be on your own because there are bigger things going on in the county besides the fact that you don't have air conditioning. You're going to have to put things in perspective. So now I'm going to introduce my friend. Oh, am I allowed to say one more thing? I've got one more minute. My little thing. I hate having like the clock ticking. Going to just go over a couple things real fast. Number one, have a plan. Number two, don't be alone. There is nothing worse than being in a storm situation by yourself. Invite a neighbor over, especially if you have an older neighbor. Stay calm, easy for me to say, right? But if you really take deep yoga breaths and think about it, it will help. Really, it does help, that and a glass of wine. Um, but then again, you might have bangs the next day, who knows? Um, I'm a big person for saying don't multitask because when you multitask, you're running around doing 10 things at once and you're getting stressed. But if you do one thing at a time, it's just a little bit calmer. You'll get more done, believe it or not. Um, be methodical. That's why we have the list. One thing at a time, okay? Check it off as you go. I actually went to Target to buy stuff and had my list with check marks on it. Um, Follow the, check, follow the checklist. Be prepared. Don't be complacent. Do not think it's not going to happen again. It's going to happen, okay? Don't think it's not going to happen. And it could be worse. Or it could be not as bad, but it affects you worse than it did before, okay? Be patient with yourself. Remember, Rome wasn't created in a day. You're not going to get this list done in one day. So be patient with yourself and with others. And the last thing I want to say, and I know you've heard it before, but this is so important. Be kind. Everybody else is going through the same thing that you are going through. Everybody else is stressed. Everybody else has a lot of things going on, and they're nervous. They're just as nervous as you. So be kind. Now I'm going to turn you over to Dan Summers. And as I said, he's the Director of Emergency Management for Collier County. He is fascinating and he's a lot of fun and he's smart, smart, smart. And I'm lucky to also call him my friend. So Dan. Thank you. I'll give you 25 minutes. Okay. <laughs> this feels weird being up here on the stage, being uh, right up front. And <laughs> just everybody gets wine, but those of us doing emergency work, okay? There's no wine uh, do do? Uh, served down in the Emergency Operations Center. We don't do that. We I'm Dan Summers. I'm director of Carrier we'll County's Bureau of Emergency before. Services yeah, and Emergency Management. I'm real honored to be with you, and thank you for this terrific uh, turnout as well. I have a million things to say that I possibly can't get to in 20 minutes, and I do look forward to our Q&A. Marla asked me to start off a little bit with some numbers just to kind of put Hurricane Irma in perspective. But before I do, let me just mention this. I am in my 31st year full-time professional emergency management. I've done 19 presidential disaster declarations, most of those almost a, a tie now between Collier County and Wilmington, North Carolina. And um, this past season, Collier County 
return the favor to many of its neighbors by responding to the panhandle uh, during Hurricane Michael. And I will tell you in my 31 years, I don't think I've ever been quite so rattled uh, as what took place and what I saw and what I witnessed uh, following Hurricane Michael. Uh, Collier County sent a large number of resources. We returned the favor because we had a lot of Panhandle folks helping us uh, during Hurricane Irma. Uh, we took our mass casualty ambulance bus up there, removed the last seven patients from the hospital at Mexico Beach, in Panama City, and got those patients transported uh, to uh, Fort Walton Beach Trauma Center, and it was an incredible operation what took place. So you know we had it tough, but please keep those folks in your hearts and prayers with a much more significant recovery. Um, I heard a new number today that absolutely took my breath away. Bay County has now lost 41% of its elementary students as of this month. 41% is telling you how many families have had to move out of the county, and they're expecting somewhere around a 52% decrease in elementary school enrollment in Bay County for the fall. So a significant impact related to their housing and their operations and their attempt to rebuild. And so, you know, you kind of put that in perspective, how blessed we are to have the resources that we have, the newer construction, and certainly a, a county commission that's been supporting preparedness for many, many years. Uh, the second component, I guess I really wanted to mention to you is to talk a little bit about the magnitude of Irma, and I hope that you're recovering well. I just got rid of my blue tarp, so if you still have a blue tarp, you're in a glue, you're still in a good club, okay? Uh, but um, you know, it takes time. These things do take a lot of time uh, in your management and recovery. But let's talk about what we accomplished and what we went through during Irma. First of all, the debris removal mission. Very, very challenging for Collier County. We have actually had a model disaster debris removal program that FEMA has utilized and shared with other communities. But we were on the heels of Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey consumed about 40%, 40% of the United States disaster resources, continental U.S., were engaged in Harvey, and then we had Irma, okay? And so we had a hard time getting supplies and equipment. FEMA was strapped already with uh, personnel being committed uh, in that particular disaster. And it took us a few extra days to get our debris removal operations mobilized. Um, Collier County had its act together, not only following FEMA policy, but working with a very reliable contractor. We even had some of our contractors that were hijacked on the highway and going to, they were requested to go to other communities. We held the line, we had our staging uh, sites in place and the word got out that the uh, haulers were much more efficient over here because we had staging sites, they could make more trips, they could make more money, they were much more efficient. Um, how many of you need some mulch? 3.6 million cubic yards, can I hook you up with a million today? <laughs> All right, that 3.6 million cubic yards is how much that we picked up in vegetative debris in Collier County and probably close to a million cubic yards of construction and demolition debris, obviously related to Everglades City and Marco, those areas that were impacted uh, by the storm. Power, very frustrating for all of us, but let me just give you a little bit of a comparison. During Hurricane Wilma, with only about two or three counties without power, it took Florida Power and Light uh, 18 days to get 90% of the power back to the impacted area following Hurricane Wilma. Hurricane Irma, five million accounts for Florida Power and Light without power. Five million accounts, okay? They got 90% of the power back within 10 days. An incredible effort on their part they're spending a lot of money when we all have some angst about our bill every month. They're spending a lot of money in hardening portions of the grid, okay, to make that much more wind resilient, which I think is an excellent, excellent investment. So hats off to FPNL, although we all had some frustrating times and experiences, et cetera, et cetera. Fuel. All of us got a little frustrated about fuel. Let's talk about fuel just a little bit. Uh, here's a little trivia. How many of you think our 
fuel in Florida is piped. None of our fuel in South Florida comes in by pipe. There are four ports, there are sea ports, Port Manatee, Everglades, I'm sorry, Port Everglades, Miami, and I just drew a blank on the third. Uh, no, not Jacksonville. Anyway, uh, Tampa, Tampa. Four ports, okay? When well, uh, Irma was coming our way, it was snaking, right? It was going to be the East Coast, it was going to be the West Coast. All of us on the West Coast were hoping it was the East Coast, and I was talking to my counterparts on the other, and we were making side bets. No, not really. But we, but we had that discussion, and seriously, what happened, both of those ports had to close. And we learned a lot from that process, and the governor has the authority to do certain things to allow more trucks to move or trucks to run longer. The ports certainly are challenged, but we do not have a pipeline in South Florida. There is one pipeline that's owned by the military, goes from Jacksonville to Orlando, so we are dependent upon barge traffic or uh, um, ocean vessel traffic for our fuel. Now, we say, okay, we did have fuel in the ground here, but we didn't have power. Well, the, the service stations are very reluctant, okay, to start taking all cash transactions. So what are we used to doing at the pump? So what happened? In many cases, we got power back, but every pump at the point of sale is internet connected, all right? So another reason to pay a little close attention and, and be a little bit patient about getting that fuel, safely storing that fuel, and being a little bit patient with the restoration. And we're working with the state State Legislature, Florida Division of Emergency Management is working on some new fuel strategies. Nothing that, that they're going to guarantee that's going to be fixed by this season, but really looking at some long-term supply chain solutions that might make retail fuel a little bit more palatable and a little bit more reliable for us. How many of you in the room went to a shelter? Just a few? Okay. Um, uh, here's, here's the takeaway for the shelters. We call it the lifeboat, not the love boat, okay? It's just the basic accommodations. We do everything that we can to provide portable power. We have a great working relationship with Dr. Patton at Collier District Schools. Her team really, her staff really stepped up to help the county staff, and we opened up 26 shelters. I hope never to open up 26 shelters again, okay? But this was a very squirrely track in terms of where it was ultimately going to provide the greatest impact in Collier County. And Gulf storms, Gulf, uh, Gulf of Mexico storms, are more likely to intensify much more rapidly, in some cases, than an Atlantic storm. So this was very, very unusual. Um, I, I never thought I would say this. I'd rather have a direct hit or a paralleling hit storm as opposed to what happened with Irma coming up the spine of the state and eventually made its first landfall, as you know, in Monroe County in the Keys and its first continental U.S. landfall at Marco Island. So lots going on there in terms of forecast or track. I want to get you to look at your handouts just for a second and look at the one called Alert Collier. All right, this is, we talked about this last year. Alert Collier is now in place. It's the little trifold brochure. Now, while you're, before you look at it, listen to me just for a second. How many, everybody here has a sm cell phone, right? Okay, probably a smartphone. And if you're like me, I don't know all the features, so I call my grandson Riley for technical support. Okay, that's what it looks like. So here's what, a, here's, yeah, here's what I want to tell you about Alert Collier. What I, want, what I want to suggest to you is this. We now have the capability to send an automated notification to your cell phone and to your published landline telephone, meaning your residential phone or a business phone. Now let me explain. This is not the typical robocall that you get during election season. Okay, that's just not it. Um, if you have a published phone number in Collier County, we already have a record of that. We have about 147,000 phone lines or, uh, or numbers tied to a geographical location in Collier County, which means it, it used to be called like a reverse 911. It means we can go to the computer, and let's give you an example. Heaven forbid at Immokalee Road and 41, we have a chlorine gas leak. 
and we need to evacuate that area. Well, we'll certainly do everything, our responders will do everything possible to clear that area, including going door to door. No one alert notification system does all the work. We can go to a computer, we can draw a circle around that intersection, pull up a canned message and hit a button, and within seconds, we can notify thousands of people by landline phone, or cellular phone, or text, or email, depending on how you register at the site, and select your emergency information. And we can give an emergency message very quickly. So, but what you have to do with a cell phone is you have to go to the internet, and that's what that brochure will explain for you to do. You have to opt in. It is against the law for me to hit your cell phone without your permission. So you go and you opt in, you'll get a test call, okay, and the test call will make sure everything works. Then you're registered with us. You can also set quiet time. If you don't want to have a notification after 11 p.m., you can set that on the, uh, on the menu with the computer. There are some things that you will automatically get day or night. One of those will be a hurricane warning or a tornado warning, okay? That we want you to get. We want to wake you up if a tornado warning is coming from your area. The severe weather is not initiated by Collier County. The severe weather alert is initiated by the National Weather Service in Miami, and it just happens that our computer picks it up and puts that information out. So make sure that you have your cell phone set for government alerts. Make sure that you go on Collier Alert, Alert Collier, pardon me, <coughs> Alert Collier and, and get registered with us. And if you have any questions in the process, there are phone numbers on there that you can call and our staff will help you through that. So Alert Collier, really good information. Second thing, how many of you own a NOAA, N-O-A-A -A, weather alert radio? Oh, good for you, good for you. You know, I like to be able to say the word FM radio and people don't look at me like I'm crazy. If you say FM radio to somebody under the age of 18, they give you a deer in the headlights look, all right? <laughs> NOAA weather radio is a form of FM radio and it sits quietly on your desk and it will alert if we have severe weather. It also allows me, as your local emergency manager, to activate this radio and send a local emergency message. I used this a lot during the wildfire season two years ago when we were doing some evacuation out in the estates. So get the NOAA weather radio. It runs off house current, and if the current goes off, it has a battery in it, and it's a great, great battery backup. The tower is here locally. It's actually on Everglades Boulevard. Very robust, very reliable. You'll see these at the end caps at Publix, and you'll see it at Lowe's and Home Depot, et cetera. Eh, $34, $39, something like that. This is a great, great... Um, backup uh, tool that you have. Now, power was out, right? So I'm not going to say go to the internet, but if the power is up, or you've got your cell phone device charged, and you've got your chargers, and your car chargers, and your backup chargers, okay? We do a really good job in Collier County putting information on the internet, putting it on our Twitter page, and our Facebook as well. So check those out, become familiar with what we're doing. We're really good at putting information out. We did 18 press, live press conferences. I did all 18 of them up until 17. I was pretty good, 18. I was looking pretty rough on the edges, but I got through it. But we did that to get that information out. We have a hurricane hotline that we post. It's a seven digit number. We took 37,000 calls during Hurricane Irma to provide general information to the public what was open, what was closed, what roads were open. Please do not dial 911 to find out if your cable's coming back on, okay? <coughs> Please don't, they're already, we laugh, but you'd be surprised. Um, but that, that's really for life-threatening emergency situations, okay? Those folks were incredibly busy and our seven-digit hurricane hotline is designed to help provide you some basic information as well, okay? One other comment, and we'll see how we're doing on time here, but one other comment I want to make too is that um, I realize that those are long hours uh, when you wait for these storm events and you're watching the forecast track. Um, patience is important. Being part of the solution as opposed to being part of the problem, and if you can be a good neighbor and help out 
or help out at church or help a volunteer agency, whether it's blood, sweat, or cash. Any of those kind of things are very, very helpful during this process. In the decision-making process, I want you to know a couple of things. Everybody remembers the lollipop, right? The cone of uncertainty that's on the forecast track. Now, the last couple of storms, that forecast track has been pretty good. And you see the dotted line in the middle, right? The dotted line is no guarantee as to where the track or what, what the storm will ultimately do. The dotted line is the average of all of the forecast models. The cone is the outside of the average of the forecast track. So if we're in that cone, we sometimes call it the cone of uncertainty, if you're in that cone, that is a clue to you, especially if it starts to narrow, it is a clue to you that you have to take action because the more the cone narrows, that means the averages of the forecast tracks are getting better. The dotted line plus or minus 75 miles, 75 miles, let's say north or south of that track if the storm's headed to Collier County, is considered a bullseye. That's as good as the forecasting gets, okay, and they're really good. Now, that will compress, that gets better in time, but in these early stages, when we're watching that cone of uncertainty, that's what I'm telling Marla, that says when you're looking at that and you're gonna make your plan, we want you to go well inland. How do you make your final decision about evacuation? It's you evaluating your personal risk. What is best for me to weather this storm. Is it well inland with family or friends or a hotel? Okay, it might be well inland. It could be two or three miles uh, further west inside of Collier County. Your concept of operations is, I want you to hide from the wind, but run from the water. So as we're looking at storm surge modeling, it is the storm surge that we're most worried about that causes the most amount of damage. Remember in Irma, we took about the highest gust that we took in Irma was about 146 miles per hour. Now, did we have structural failure in Collier County? No. Doesn't mean we couldn't have an intermittent tornado, but we lost shingles and we lost a lot of limbs, but generally we held up pretty well in our, in our newer homes, et cetera, especially anything built after 1992. So if you're in a storm surge inundation area, which we will notify, which is in your little evacuation map there, then you know I want you off of that coastal environment. That's the higher risk when we see storm, when we see storm surge values. A cubic yard of seawater weighs over a ton. So when you put wave and wind action with that seawater, um, or with the surge, rather, you have an enormous force working against you in terms of your personal safety, okay? So hide from the wind, run from the water, evaluate your personal risk, and personal risk is when I'm gonna go, where I'm gonna go. If you ask me for a destination, I'm gonna say Kansas. <laughs> okay, Kansas is not very practical, but you need to think about what's my, what's my driving distance comfort, uh, where can I find good refuge, family, friends, hotel, those kind of things so that you can execute. You have medical issues, medical concerns, um, maybe you're electrically dependent or oxygen dependent, then you know that what you have to work with is time. That means you're going to take your steps and do them earlier as opposed to some of us that can do steps later, all right? So think that through, have that family discussion, talk with family and friends, and last but not least, how many of you text on the cell phone? Okay, good. Texting is a great, great way during times of emergency because most times texting will go through. Texting uses this, this much resource in the cellular network. A voice call takes this much resource and an internet call takes this much, or an internet uh, where you're pulling internet data. So most of the time texting will go through. So set up a group text with the kids, family or friends, neighbors, and then just send each other little short <coughs> messages like send more wine or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, 
but just do that little short texting messages and practice that. Set up a little group text. And uh, my grandson Riley is available. He'll work for pizza for technical support. <laughs> just uh, see me after the meeting. So let's stop and take a few questions because I'm already up on my Wait, time. Well, I want to say, whoops. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. I want to say two things before we go to the Q&A. Um, the first thing is, is Facebook is a waste your data, okay? And I know that people are, Facebook, they're going to they're gonna be sending, are you okay? Are you okay? One of the things you should do and plan in advance is to say to people, I'll check in and let you know I'm safe after the storm. Because the more the more you look at the TV, the more you talk about it, the more you text, the more you're on Facebook, your anxiety is going to go up. So just stay calm, check in when the storm is over. The other thing I want to say when we're talking about plans, it is so important that you're not alone. Okay? I had actually had nine people stay in my condo. There was no room for me, I went someplace else. But <laughs> true story, but I had nine people in my in my condo. I had um, two couples that live near me and they had no plans and I didn't want them to be alone. I have shutters. So really make sure that you that you're not alone and make sure your neighbors aren't alone and check in with them before and after the storm. Okay? Just you know knock on their door. Are you okay? You don't want to be alone. So we're gonna do Q and A and um, Okay, and if we go a little bit over, is that okay with everybody? Because yeah. this is important. All right, I'm going to start with you, ma'am. I've, I've been told that FPL has surge protectors that take care of the whole house. I have been trying all day to find a way to get to them. Their automated lines do not have a button that you can press that gives you FPL surge protection. I can't get a live person. I can answer that. Okay, so um, I've had the same situation. What you have to do is just, you just keep hitting zero or you keep saying representative. You have to be creative because I got the letter in the mail just like you did. Um, you just have to try to be creative. Sometimes, believe it or not, if you don't get an answer, go on a Facebook page and actually call them out on it. Have you been? Have you been to their website yet? Yes. Okay. Somewhere in that website, and I haven't, I can't say today, but in the past I have seen that, that whole house surge protection as a option I will, somewhere. I will try again Some, because operator and representative not do not, okay. no, we don't okay. recognize that. We'll take a look and, and we'll do some research yeah. on that. Maybe we can Thank post it you. on your site. Okay. Um, what we'll do is we'll try to get an answer. I can post things on my personal site. Um, you can go on Marla Ottenstein on Facebook or you can go to Professional Organizer Florida on Facebook and I will post anything that Dan gives me. Yes, sir. Uh, a comment about <clears throat> that. It might be more effective and cheaper if you went to your good electrician and have them put in surge protectors. That way you're not paying a monthly fee to FPL. <laughs> Thank you. Go to your electrician and have, have your electrician hook your house up. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm going to get to everybody, OK? David had his hand up first. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you have a radio there on the end of the table. Would you comment on that? Yeah. Somebody want. actually gave it to me. I've never used it, but okay. <laughs> Let's yeah, talk about radio for a minute. I'm I'm plugging the NOAA weather radio, but certainly AM FM radio. This happens to be a crank style that generates its own power without the battery. Okay, that's an option. Now a lot of folks had a lot of questions about FM broadcasts from our local news media, etc. Who knows what our emergency alert FM radio station is in Collier County? No. Nope. It's w Good guess, though. FGCU. WGCU 90.1 public radio. And I actually have a backup satellite telephone link from my command center over to WGCU FM. So 90.1 is that FM station. Now, we have a small media market here. So sometimes a lot of these FM stations will go to syndication, which means they push a button and pick up a computer feed from 
somewhere in California, and that's the end of the broadcast, uh, the live broadcast. A lot of our broadcasters are still looking at simulcasting with, for example, maybe Wink TV and Wink FM. As an example, will simulcast. That just means that all of a sudden you're hearing TV conversation over the radio. So look around. But emergency alert, WGCU FM, you'll have to scout the FM dial because there's no law or policy or FCC requirement that these stations stay on the air during times of an emergency or if they lose power or connectivity, what have you. But scout the FM radio dial. Yes, ma'am. We're going to get to everybody, I promise. Um, I evacuated for um, Irma to Virginia, and I had to sleep in my car. But my question is, if I stay home and my electricity goes off at, for an extended amount of time, who do I call to teach me how to open my garage door? That's a really good question. Did everybody hear? Okay, so here's another thing I want to just throw in there. A lot of people think that you should put your, put your car in to the garage and you back it up all the way to where the door is because that's going to prevent the garage door from being coming in, okay? That's a fallacy. After a storm, you'll go and you'll see there are a lot of crushed um, fenders on cars. But I actually went to my handyman. I said, show me how to do this manually. And he showed me. And there's also a way to lock your garage. But I just went to my handyman and I said, teach me how. And it's not hard. Okay, okay? that was a great question. It's yes, ma'am. Pull rope. Yeah. Pull rope. The hurricanes that I have with Florida Power and Life. Exactly. Um, this lady wanted to know what exactly does the FPL um, Power Shield do? And I don't know. I oh. know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I, yeah, if my friends at FPNL watch this tonight, we'll see how I do, right? My power might be cut off here shortly. Um, the surge protector is designed to, when they're big bumps or big surges in the system, it's designed to regulate that voltage so that it does not go into your appliances and your electronics. It buffers any excess power that's coming through, okay? And sometimes that happens. Now, let me, see, let me tell you what we do downtown in our emergency operations center. If you are at home and you are getting fluctuations in power, or the power is what we call bumping or bouncing, okay? It's a really good idea at that point to go ahead and go to the panel box and cut everything off. Bumping power is going to, you know, it's rough on your equipment, especially electronic equipment. And AC, it's, it's and hell on it, your air conditioning. It's rough on the AC system. So if you're going, if, if the winds are starting to pick up for some reason and you're comfortable doing it, go to the breaker panel, cut everything off. Let the storm pass. So these fluctuations in FPNL, they're monitoring all of this remotely. So they're doing everything that they can from their substations. That technology is there to keep those bounces and the power down to a minimum. But sometimes when the wind and the power lines start bouncing or, or transformers start blowing, crazy things happen. So we cut ours off when anytime we get a fluctuation and we immediately go to our generator power and stay on it until the situation stabilizes. You know how I said you learn something? I just learned that. I always go and hand turn off my TV, turn off my air conditioning. But this yeah. is so much smarter and takes so much less time. Well, and cut it off at the appliance and then go cut the, the oh, breaker okay. panel off. Yes, sir, in the green. What's the hurricane call your phone number? Pardon me? Oh, Dan. Well, we don't want you to be calling Check all the time. The hurricane call your telephone oh. number. Oh. Two things. Um, the hurricane hotline number for us is 252-8444, and we'll plaster that when the event happens. And we have 16 operators standing by, uh, 16 folks that are there to take calls. Very helpful, I hope. 252-8444. Um, and if you sign up for Alert Collier, Sound, sound like I'm from the South. When you sign up, you with are an alert from. Call your, but you alert, are from the South. <laughs> alert caller, the phone number that you'll get on call, call on caller ID is also two five two. That's the Collier County's governmental prefix. So a two five two number is a legit Collier County call. All right, two five two eight four 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 is our hurricane hotline. Two five two. 
is the prefix that will come from our alert collier mass notification. And while we're doing numbers, let's do some more trivia. What's FPNL's number? 1-800-4 outage. How about that? 1-800-4 outage. And you should call that number when your power goes out so your your address point gets put into the computer system. If they get power on your street and you had some type of damage from the street to the house, it's not going to be picked up immediately by the repair crew. But if you go ahead and dial in and register your address, those address points show up on the workman or on the lineman's repair, so that will help get you back on. The number? Yes, for FPNL 1 800 4, the number 4, outage. Now, don't ask me what outage is on the phone, so you'll have to look at the keypad. All right, I'm going to take some from this side. Trust me, we'll come back. Yes, sir. Oh, you're only allowed one. No. <laughs> Oh, that's good. And what's the second one? The second one is, I'm under the impression that the law was changed last year regarding mandatory acceptance of tests in all hotels. Okay, so that's a good, um, those are two questions. I'm going to repeat them and then give it to Dan. The first part of the question is um, safe practices when it comes to getting gas. And then the second question was um, that he, oh, sorry, for storing gas. Thank you. And then also, um, when you do evacuate, um, what's the policy with hotels about pets? Okay. On the gasoline, all right, this is a little tricky, and I'm, you know, I don't want to say I'm a government employee, you'll get the best I have, but let me just tell you, you got to be careful here. First of all, always used an approved can. We're all used to these plastic cans, all right? I'm only a mediocre fan of the plastic cans. I prefer a metal safety can. Now I will tell you that a metal safety can is four times the price. But the issue is how much better you can control any, any venting of a gas can of a safety can. Now you got to think about where let's say um, is Lanai an okay place to put gasoline? At the end of the day, the answer is no, because first of all, you better not be running the, ga the gasoline generator on the lanai. If I was king for a day in the state of Florida, I would require a carbon monoxide detector be sold with every portable generator. Portable generator. But now, here are some options. Let's say maybe you're in a townhome. Um, I have suggested that maybe, first of all, don't overbuy. Don't be filling up a Rubbermaid trash can. We had somebody do that at Sam's here just the other day um, in a trash can, I kid you not. So you use an approved gas can. Another option might be, what if you have a pool box? Okay, empty out the pool box, put the fuel cans there. Can you put them in the garage? The answer is yes. You can put them in the garage, but at any point you're picking up gasoline fumes, you have a problem, all right? Now, a good can like that, maybe even inside a pool box, or even if you wanted to strap it, if you wanted to tie this down just in case, all right, then put it outside the house. So outside storage is always better. Buying a, a more robust fuel can is a better option, okay? And again, don't store it in the house. Garage, lanai might be eh, okay, or maybe lanai in a pool box, something like that that's gonna be secure through the process. It's not going to get hot, okay, because you're not going to be in those extreme temperatures, okay, but just use some common sense about where you put it, and certainly it doesn't go in the garage where you, if you have a natural gas or a propane gas powered hot water heater, something like that, keep it away from any potential ignition source and secure it. Um, the pets, a gentleman oh, asked pets, about pets. Pets. Uh, first of all, I, I don't know that I can quote the law about hotels, generally speaking, and I keep moving around for the reflection of the noise. Yeah, we got that. Generally speaking, most hotels, at least during times of storm, document whether they are pet friendly or not. 
I think they are allowed to put some regulation as to the size of the animal, and I do think they're allowed to charge some reasonable uh, charge for cleaning, et cetera. So I can't tell you that it is a law, but what you're finding is that the industry itself is a whole lot more interested in getting your business during that period and trying to be reasonably accommodating. You always call ahead, and I think you check the websites as well, and you'll find a majority of those are pet friendly or at least have some portion of their rooms that are pet friendly. And honestly, I think as an industry, at least in South Florida, uh, related to the disaster, uh, we're seeing more and more of these uh, chains being much more pet owner friendly. I'm going to add something to that. If you do take a pet to a shelter, you must have, oh, that thing's going again. You must have a crate, and your dog's not going to stay with you in your little air mattress. Right. They have a special place for pets that you can go visit, but, you know, this is serious business. This is not, this is not fun and games. Um, let me get, yes, sir. Just a quick one for you. Yes, sir. You were talking about when your power bounces around, turn it off. What are the indications that power is bouncing all over the place. <laughs> well, uh, really, all I can really say is when you're seeing fluctuations. Uh, Lights have, blinking. If you're just seeing the, you're seeing stuff go off or come back on or go back off, or come back on, those kind of things. And the gentleman was asked, well, asked me, also asked me when do you know it's all clear? Um, check with your neighbor, is your power back on? Uh, or here's the other thing I would do. You can bring the breakers back up, but bring it at, bring him bring the breakers back on Wonderful. to non-sensitive equipment. A light bulb. Like, yeah, just bring it to the lamps or the yeah. interior lighting. Not your TV and not, air conditioning. Not your TV and not your air conditioner. Okay. That's that's a little that's a little rough. Good point, thank you. Okay, let me, this lady's had her hand up for a long time. I'm getting my steps in. Um, yes, is there a central place that we can get information on what roads are open and closed and, and, and stoplights? Because last year there were like roads that the stoplights were off and it was just really scary. Yeah. So, well, you shouldn't be driving, trust me. Like my mother driving on the highway to go play bridge right before there. I swear to God, I couldn't make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> right to the store. Uh, first of all, a couple of rules of thumb. Um, wait for us to give you the all clear, okay? If you're being pushed or some, some, there's some overwhelming reason you get out there. But there's a reason that there's a curfew in place, not only just to keep th folks behave, but it's also intended to keep you off the road. It, it, it's incredibly dark, okay? Stoplights, we do everything that we can. Um, I know that we have almost uh, 100 portable generators that we can put on major intersections to repower them. But if we have structural damage to the signal, which we had in a lot of cases, although the, the, the stanchions, the metal, the metal uh, stoplight arms and those kind of things are much more rent wind resilient, and as long as the cabinet, the control cabinet remains intact, we can try to get power out there. In a lot of cases, we still have to put those on four-way stop, okay? So if you've got to learn, go back and check the book about how to remember who has the right-of-way in a four-way stop. We're also revisiting this year, taking major intersections and requiring right turn only. And you're going to go, what? That means that if you're coming to an intersection, you can only turn right, you're going to have to go down the road a ways, find a, cut, uh, find a place for a U-turn and come back. And we're doing that because it requires less officers to man that intersection that we can use those law enforcement officers somewhere else. So four-way stop is very likely. Do all of your, everything you need to do during daylight hours, okay? Be incredibly patient, and I know I was here on a Mockley Road when it was pitch dark, no street lights, everything was out, and honest to goodness, you think you know where you are and you don't. So you gotta be careful. You can call our hotline and we'll talk about roads that are open and closed, but honestly, at that point, it's such a moving target as to what roads we've got. It's changing every 10 minutes. So we'll do our best to post it, do what you need to do during daylight hours when we talk about it being relatively clear for you to go and be patient. 
Okay, see, and also, where are you rushing after a hurricane? It's not like anything's open, right? I mean, so stay home, read a book, talk to your family. Ma'am. Wait. Yes. Okay, this yes. thing needs to be edited because it right. has 5 feet at the yeah. coast and 41 feet in the monthly. But that, it, it, it's cumulative. It's cumulative. So if, if, you're, if, for, if we were, it is a little confusing on the map. Okay, so here's a rule of thumb. Collier County generally only, esca, or only elevates one foot in sea level for every one mile inland. One foot of sea level on general is the rise one mile inland, every foot. Now, a slow moving, moderate category, large storm, there have been 500 models run to run that map. It's, that map is not arbitrarily done, it's done by supercomputer by NASA. In the right quadrant of the storm hitting Collier County in the right direction at a lunar high tide, when it says 30 to 40 feet of water, means 30 to 40 feet of water might put five feet of water in Immokalee, and it's probably gonna put 30 feet of water in Naples. So it is a stacking effect on that map. It is a little bit confusing, but look down at the key. So if you look at the hot, and we just need to do a graphic of this at some point. And actually, the trifold is <laughs> Wait, a little bit better. Wait, that means I need to do the graphic at some point. Marla, you need to do the graphic. But here's, here's my point. If we're talking a 10 to 11 foot storm surge, and you live east of 41, for the most part, we're expecting 9 to 10 feet. And I said 10 to 11. You're going to expect 9 to 10 feet of water along US 41, okay? That's what we're talking about. Think about blowing across a soup bowl and you're blowing that water to the back of the soup bowl. That's exactly what you're doing with a hurricane because you're lowering the barometric pressure, which brings the sea level elevation up a little bit, and then Mother Nature is pushing all that water across land. And again, go back and look at the videos of Hurricane Michael and you will see that level, that slow water level rise in some cases to 11 feet. Now, I think the 41 is biblical. I hope that doesn't happen on my watch, but it does, that it is explaining to you that there is a stair step effect based on the category of storm or the storm surge intensity that we're predicting. And when we do these evacuations, and if you can get to the internet, the Hurricane Center is now giving us predictive storm surge models. So they're telling me on a map almost to the neighborhood level what they're expecting that storm surge to be. What you need to know is, you say, well, if I, my finished floor eleva elevation on my survey is eight feet above sea level, okay? Well, if I put two feet of water at your road, guess what? You need to be gone. It's government work, it's an estimate. It's a static model that we run for these things. So the storm is dynamic, the model is static. So if we're talking about a foot or two of water in your neighborhood with the storm surge prediction coming from the National Hurricane Center, you don't need to be there, okay? Yes, sir. We received a, uh, a message from our association <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. If there's a storm surge and you're in your hot attic, um, it didn't seem to make much sense. Um, I'll repeat the question or the comment. This gentleman said that his association said um, everybody should evacuate to their attic. Please don't do that. <laughs> ah, <laughs> that's a good answer. Don't do. Li listen, we're 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 pretty good. Plus, I keep my resume current. But no, we're pretty good at this. We're going to give you the best recommendation. I'm always going to do a couple of things. I'm going to round up my modeling one storm category in case Mother Nature escalates the category of that storm, number one. And secondly, I'm going to add four hours to any decision-making process in the event that that storm picks up in forward motion. As it picks up in forward motion, my evacuation time window begins to collapse. 
So I'm going to round up. And we also know from studies that you're going to think about it for a couple hours before you act. Attic is not the way to go. Um, I won't beat up on your association, but I'll just say, hey, listen to what local government can share. I'm going to also add something. With this checklist, just to let you know that thing's going off, um, this checklist is available if you go to naplesnews.com and you put in hurricane checklist. Please send it to all your friends, your family, send it to your association, your board presidents, ask them to reprint it. Yes, it is copyrighted, but I'm giving you permission, okay? Um, print it out. It's an easy thing to print out, one, either two pages or one page with both sides. Send it to everybody you know. The more people who are prepared for a storm, the better we're going to be off as a community. Um, I guess we have time for about four or five more questions. Yes, sir. As we're getting more and more information, whether it's on the radio, on TV, about the wind, the rain, and those of us that have enclosures, do you recommend that we actually cut the screen? Um, did I, everybody hear that yeah. question? Okay. I, 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 I really don't know what to tell you. I've seen it work pros and cons in both ways. And the last thing, I, Dan's going to say cut my screen and your insurance guy's <laughs> not going to buy that, okay? It's a judgment call for you. Um, I think if you're really going to have to evaluate what, you, what you've got going on with the, with the cage, the structural integrity, S screens are pretty inexpensive to replace, although you have to get in line to do that. I could never give you that recommendation. Some folks have maybe have had some experience with that. I'm going to claim Switzerland on that one. <laughs> this lady here. I was going to say, I had questions, but the, the, I was at the um, briefing that the fire department gave, and they said take your screen doors off. It right. gives room for the wind to go through. Don't cut your screens. There you go. Okay, so that's a good answer. you put your shutters up, take your screen doors off. Uh, my question was, and I'm going to show my technical ignorance here. Um, I have one of those little trim line phones, and I had a NOAA weather radio. None of them worked. The, the phone, I guess, was connected to Comcast, and so when Comcast went down, oh. it went down. And good the point. NOAA weather radio was nothing but static. Okay. All right, well, that's a really good point. Um, you know, my mother, she got, um, she has everything bundled. She's got Comcast for the phone, Comcast for her television. Don't do that. You got to pay $35. You're a slight CenturyLink. Well, because if, you're, if your cable goes down. My mother has CenturyLink, and hers didn't work either. Okay, well, mine's work. You know what, this is, you just never know. No matter how prepared you are, no matter how prepared and no matter what we tell you today, I hate to tell you, but you know what happens, right? Sometimes things happen. And once again, we're going to go back to be patient with yourself. Be patient with others. It, it's happening to everybody. So, you know, I, maybe you can't call. I, I need to clarify. Can I, yes. can I help on that one? That's an important one. I'm not is, discounting is, you. I'm is just your saying. NOAA weather radio working today? No, it, I threw it out. It didn't work at all. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it didn't okay. work at all. Sorry, my all back's here. Right. And I don't, please, I don't, um, I'm a guy and I don't read the instructions. But these, these radios do have to be programmed. There are key features in there that you have to, there are 11 of those NOAA weather radio channels 162.5, 162.17. And you have to either, you have to look on the instruction manual or you have to flip through the different channels. You have to flip through the different channels to get it set locally. Um, so what you do is you, when you buy that, when you go and get another one today, um, <laughs> when you go and get another one, okay, it, it is continuous broadcast. It's on 24 hours a day. So when you get the local broadcast, you'll know it's working. Then you hit the alert feature and it will go silent until it alerts and then it'll wake you up. So there is a programming component associated with the NOAA Weather Radio. How about or two? Call Riley. How about two more questions? Yes. Yeah. All right, I see you're shaking your hands. I've got to go for these two ladies here. I'm three, this gentleman also. But the ladies first, okay? Sorry. You know, have you all noticed not one person asked me a question? Same thing happened the last time. Somebody said, why should they do their, sorry, my back to you. Someone said, why should I do my laundry? I'm like, why not? Uh, uh, my first question is, if we live closer to NCH here on Immokalee, 
does that, can we assume that our power will be um, uh, connected? No. Sooner? What's your second question? Okay. The other one, um, I went to a meeting at the North Collier Fire Department recently, and they had a wonderful presentation also on hurricanes. And you can sign up to become a CERF volunteer, and they teach you all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. coping mechanisms, you know, for yourself and your neighbors yep. in the event that the hurricane strikes. So that's I great. To share that. All right. So, I think that's great to know about being. Um, they teach you how your coping skills and your neighbors. But we said we have to answer that question okay. about. Wait, what was the first question again? The hospital, hospital grids. I don't believe in them. Dan? Oh, God, we're never going to need the hospital if we get sick, if no. we say anything bad. No. <laughs> the hospitals are on priority restoration. That's true. However, one of the things that you need to know is that FPNL has the ability to switch and route power in different directions. So depending on what the damage is to the grid, their first priority is to get it to the hospitals but it may not necessarily have gone down your street. It may have gone around the block is how they may have refed or rerouted that power to get to the hospitals. But yes, hospitals are on a priority. So I've got these two people back here and then we're gonna have to flip a coin. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to do it. Wait, everybody's got one question. <laughs> Give me a second. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, good evening. Um, I have a, a client base that I send the ultimate hurricane. Mwah, mwah, mwah. My name is Paul Malesko, which we communicate quite a bit. Yes, we have. Um, I want to suggest that you make an ultimate, ultimate hurricane and put the absentee owner hurricane list in with this. The people that leave, you have a list of, that you put out. And also, I would like to thank you for the fire response in my backyard. Okay. You did a nice job. Thank you. <laughs> and Paul, why don't you give me a call next week? You've got my number and we'll talk about that. I like that idea. All right, I'm gonna come to you. I haven't forgotten you, ma'am, I promise. You, it is, better be a really good question. <laughs> Since Hurricane Irma, um, have they added uh, generators to the pump stations? Oh, we knew that. I had beds. Okay, I we had... were waiting for this. We, I just have to say, we were waiting for this. We talked about this. <laughs> and I promise, ma'am. That, that was my question. Oh, okay, great. Okay. All right. All right, real quick. You're going to learn more about pump stations than you ever wanted to know in five seconds or less. There are over 800 pump stations in Collier County, public, private, municipal, okay, that includes wastewater and potable water. If we charge the ratepayer um, enough money for a generator at every one of those sites, you would not be a happy camper. Now, Collier County has 450 lift stations, as you know, that caused an enormous amount of problem during this event. Um, 22 of that 450 are main stations that had 100% backup power and 100% backup pumping capability, both power and pump. All of our uh, wastewater treatment plants are 100% backup. We also had, um, we had 80 some pump trucks rented to go in and pull wastewater out of the wells. Okay, there's a storage well at each site to keep that low. We had 46 towable generators that we distributed and ran periodically throughout the event. We have just put in a grant request into FEMA for 119 additional generators. Now, it's one thing to own a generator, it's another thing to install it, it's another cost to maintain it. But we're working really hard to bring more and more of these critical stations on, on backup power. You need to, however, do us a favor and that is get all that wastewater and laundry stuff done well in advance and minimize the consumption or minimize the flush, if you will, so we're not taxing that system when you're putting 11 or 12 inches of stormwater or rainwater into that particular system. So it was stressed 
we're doing better. We had some problems. It is a cost-benefit analysis. How much are we going to spend when you're talking about maybe $125,000 per lift station, if not more, plus maintenance and fuel? So we're working on making the, the entire grid, if you will. The potable, potable water was not a problem. We have all that pressurized. Wastewater is a little bit more of a challenge in terms of what is the best cost-benefit and maximizing that so we're having minimal impact on the ratepayer for those things, but we're doing a much, much, much better job. It's not all going to be fixed this season, um, and there even there's still six-month waiting list on a lot of bigger generators still because of all these disasters. And so it's going to take time to get the engineering done, the ordering done, and we've got a big grant application and some reserve funds from the county going in for about another hundred or so more. I'm going to take one last question from this gentleman, but in the meantime, what I want to say is I really want to thank everyone thank for you. taking time from your day to come and to learn. Please pass the information along to your friends and your family. And really, we really, both of us, we are committed, not just because this is his job, but Dan and I both are passionate about helping the community, and we want to say thank you. So please pass it on, pass on the information that you've got today. Go to the internet, make copies of the hurricane checklist, pass it on. Sir, you have the last question of the night, and thank you all so much for attending. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, natural gas uh, coming into the house. Well, what uh, is the best protocol for uh, handling Oh, good question. Natural gas? That's a great question because we've never had that question asked. What's the protocol if you have natural gas in your home? Great question. It, it's a good, uh, if you are, you need to double check, but there are ways with your wrench and your little toolkit for you to cut that gas off. But what you don't do necessarily is you don't reignite, you don't open it back up by yourself. You can cut it off, but you call the gas company before you re-energize, okay? But you can cut it off as we start getting into the peak part of the event. And, and the other thing too is, you know, if a gas line breaks, you, you're going to know it, but more importantly, go cut it off at the meter. Thank, Thank you all again. Thanks everybody, and if you want to take a look at the items on the table, feel free. Thanks again for coming. Thank you.